Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Those of you uh, might remember me. I'm Frank Tilly, an elder here at this church. My wife and I uh, just got back from Spain, where we attended a service, an English-speaking service. And it's not the same as coming to your own church. My wife said it's a little bit like coming home and sleeping in your own bed. <laughs> and and uh, it's good to be back. You know, uh, I want to spend, uh, extend a special invitation, uh, welcome at least, to anyone who is here for the first time, here in person, or if you're visiting online for the first time. Uh, we'd like to keep in touch. If you're in person, see me afterwards at the service. If you're online, uh, please send us an email. Our guest speaker today is Aaron White. He's the director of Collingwood Youth for Christ. We've heard him before. Welcome back, Aaron. And look behind me. Isn't this great? Our choir is here and it's in the house and uh, Deb Fitzsimmons as our director. Next Sunday, October the 2nd, is Worldwide Communion Sunday with our interim moderator uh, providing the worship and leading it. We will be using pre-packaged juice and wafers rather than the uh, communion trays. And those watching online, we're encouraging you to have bread and juice or even wine available to you. Again, communion is next Sunday, don't forget. Now Donna Mansfield has an announcement. Hi there. Like fall follows summer, Christmas follows fall. So this is the time of year that I ask you as our congregation to determine if you're able to aid in providing a Christmas hamper for families in need in our community. I'd like to have about one month to gather your names without the matching taking place. I know it's early this year, but I'm going to be away the last Sunday in October and the first Sunday in November. So I wanted everyone to think if they're able to provide and to provide Marlene with your names. I will then call you after the 9th of November to determine the type and needs of a family you feel best you're able to aid. Almost immediately, I'll start to accept names from families in need and I'll be, begin to match. Uh, I hope that's okay. I'm here until the 24th of October. So if you have any questions, please, please make contact with me. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. The Alpha course, which you may have seen uh, on our screens earlier this month, is, <coughs> begins on Zoom uh, on Tuesday at 7 p.m. If we can get sufficient numbers uh, registered from First Pres, we'd like to have our only a group that is just First Pres people. So please think about it. It's basically Christianity 101, but good for everybody. And I think you'd find it exciting and interesting and, and be part of a, a group here at First Press. If you have any questions, uh, see me after the worship service. Following, uh, following the service, you're encouraged today to go down to the lower hall for coffee and cookies. Today it's hosted by Joanne Beacock and Sheila Doner. And now let us pray together. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship you. Free our minds from the stresses of the week and help us to fully engage in the hearing of your word and the singing your praises. With one voice, we repeat the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Turn the mic on. Oh, there we go. Good morning. It's our children's time, and I've been uh, tasked with dismissing uh, the children. So if there's any kids, you can come on up. I'm going to share a really quick story. So come on up, kids, before I dismiss you. 
You can, you can sit wherever. I was told that it's a very big deal for you guys to sit up on the stage. Oh, sit on these stairs. Make yourself at home. Do you want to have the microphone? Sure. sure. Say, say something. I like church. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Guess you never know what you're going to get. So do you guys want to hear a funny story before I dismiss you? How many of you have gone to the fair that's happening right now in at the fairgrounds? Okay, so I was there yesterday. This is a really embarrassing story. I was there yesterday with my family, and we went in, and my belt on my pants broke apart, and my pants <laughs> fell right down around my ankles. <laughs> True story. So I could not walk around the fair with my pants down. So I had to go to my car and find something. What do you think is, would be in a car that you could use to hold your pants up? Let's see what some answers are. Just, get, just if you have like, just like one or two, like what do you think could be in a car? Duct tape. Duct tape. Oh, that's a good one. I did not have duct tape. <laughs> Anybody else? One more guess before I tell you. Yeah, go ahead. What is it? Break a wheel off the car and make it into a belt. <laughs> that is creative. Oh, one more, one more. A seat belt. Oh, the, you guys are way more creative than I am. Do you have an idea? Oh, that's almost, I found a bungee cord that I used in the trunk of, do you guys know what a bungee cord is? It's like a kind of a stretchy long elastic with hooks on it. It's the perfect thing for a belt. So I wrapped it around and I hooked the bungee cord around where the belt goes and it was my perfect little secret at the fair. Nobody knew and my pants stayed up. So uh, why did I tell you this story? I work with a lot of teenagers and we need to tell each other stories. Stories are so important, whether they're funny or embarrassing or important. Stories are so important when we're sharing our story with other people. And we have God stories, we have stories about everything. So as I dismiss you, don't be shy to tell stories about what is going on in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for our kids. Thank you for funny stories. Uh, thank you that we are um, gifted with the ability to share what's going on in our lives. And so today, just as our kids go uh, and hang out with their leaders, I just pray that you would bless them and just help them to uh, know more about you and the relationship that we have with you. In your name, amen. You're dismissed. scripture this morning is from Luke 15, verse 11 to 31. 
This is Jesus talking about the prodigal son. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now instead of waiting until you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and took a trip to a distant land. And there he wasted all the money on wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him to feed his pigs. The boy became so hungry that, he even, that the, even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired men have food enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please, take me on as a hired man. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long distance away, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening in the pen. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants he was going on, what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the calf we were fattening and has prepared a great feast. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've worked hard, and you never once refused to do a single thing, you and I never refused to do a, a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back, after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the finest calf we have. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you and I are very close, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. The word of the Lord.
Good morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, just allowing us to gather as people who are journeying towards you. Uh, we just thank you that wherever we're at in that journey of seeking your presence and entering into a relationship with you, that you bless us. Some of us here might be far from you, and some of, you, some of us might be closer than others. And we just ask that you bless us on this journey of um, entering into relationship with you and um, just trying our best to live the way that you have called us. And so we just give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Aaron White. Uh, my wife and I um, are the Youth for Christ uh, staff in Collingwood. Uh, we've been here, it will be 17 years this coming June that we have um, been working with teenagers in, uh, in our community in different, um, different ways and different capacities. And we love it because every day is different. Every, um, every story that we hear from different teenagers just energizes us to get to know them more and to walk with them on this journey of um, getting to know God more. And so um, for some of you that have walked with Danielle and I in prayer and uh, in, in financing as a, as a church, um, we, we just want to thank you for, um, for journeying with us as, um, as we invest in the lives of young people. Well, this morning, uh, I want to just share something as I, I, I was doing some really um, fun reading and research over the summer and um, just about some cultural things about the Middle East that I didn't know about. And so as I was, as I was reading uh, my Bible and reading this, this, uh, this book, um, I thought, oh, this is, re this is really fascinating. I want to start developing um, some messages on this and, and share this. So a few years ago, I took up running. Uh, I wasn't always a runner. It hurt my body. I was not in good shape, but I would aspire to run and, and enjoy it. But every time I decided to go for a jog, I would get a few hundred meters away from my house before I would reconsider my life decision to start, try and run. <laughs> I took, running took time and patience in order to build up stamina. And after I had gotten into the rhythm of, of running, I decided I was going to sign up for a race here locally. Now this was a couple of years ago, and there was a race on, on Blue Mountain called Metcon. And it was deemed a five kilometer adventure race. And it, the whole idea was it started at the base at the village of Blue Mountain and when the horn blew, all the people that, that were running would start running up the mountain from the village. And about halfway up the mountain, you would run down again. And then you would run across the mountain. And then all through this five kilometers, I think it actually turned out to be six and a half kilometers, but no one wants to really run a six kilometer race, five kilometers is more the trending thing these days. There would be 30 obstacles that, um, that you'd be met with. Now, I think I, have a, I think I have a picture of me on these, one of these obstacles. Is it gonna show? There it is, there's me. Now I have in here to wait for Rora's applause, so. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so this is one of the obstacles and there's a big pool underneath and this is really close to the end of the race and, and you're, you're covered in sweat, you're covered in mud, and then they want you to use these, this obstacle and jump on these monkey bars and then try and get your way across the monkey bars. Usually you would grab the monkey bars and your hands would be so covered in mud that you'd grab the first rung and then you would flip off backwards into the pool, which is what I did the first time. And the second time that I did Metcon, they did it the year after, this was me, I think, being successful. I was able to do it. And it's, it's difficult. I don't know if you remember monkey bars when you were a kid. It's not easy when you're an adult. Uh, and so I, I remember doing that. And um, doing Metcon was really enjoyable. Now, this was, uh, this was probably eight years ago, this picture is. Um, and I've, I've gotten a little bit more in shape than, the, than that. But after some years of running, I began to really enjoy it. And Metcon, this was kind of the beginning of my journey of enjoying running. And these days I can run a six kilometer loop for leisure and can do it in about 40 minutes. And as I was beginning to kind of study and read, I began to realize that in our Western culture, running is a verb that we, that we often live by. We're always running. We're running late. 
We run errands. We, we're running on empty. We run for exercise. You know, we, we say, I have to run to the store quickly. We're always running. And as I began to study, I realized that um, this book that I was reading about the culture of the Middle East is that people just don't run as much as we do here. They just don't run. Andrew Thompson, an Anglican priest in the United Arab Emirates, says this, it's extremely rare to see an Arab anywhere running in the Gulf in public, not in shopping malls, not in the street, anywhere. And I began to find it fascinating that as a Westerner, like Andrew Thompson, he began to describe the stark differences that he would see from his home in England and what he notices as he does ministry in the Middle East. He said, running in public is just not something you often see. And it's for one reason only, he says. It's very difficult, and there's another picture I think, there's a, a, it's very difficult to run with, I might not be saying this right, an abaya or a dishdasha. And they're, it's men and women, and, and they wear robes in the Middle East. And men, women in the, men and women in the Middle East, they wear these because they're modestly covered from head to toe. And the reason you don't see them running is simply because the robe restricts their stride while they run. And if one were to run, the only way to run is to hitch up your robe or your dress and allow your stride to improve. And he says this is largely unthinkable in the Middle East because Middle Eastern culture regards showing too much flesh as immodest and shameful. It would be undignified to do so. And he says, it's been like this in the Middle East for a very long time. The more status you have in the Middle East, the less likely you are to run, especially if you are a patriarchal figure, a tribal elder, or a landowner. However, in one of Jesus' most well-known parables, the prodigal son, Jesus breaks cultural norms to give his audience something to think about. In the prodigal son, the master storyteller of Jesus tells the story of a young man who violated almost every code of good behavior and demanded his father's inheritance before the father had even died. Kenneth Bailey, an evangelical scholar in the Middle East, decided that he wanted to get some modern-day reactions of the prodigal son from different Arabs. So he set out to tell the story, and the reactions were all the same. That would never happen in my village, one would say. And he would say, why is that? It's an impossible request to ask for an inf a father's inheritance. Then Kenneth would say, why, what would happen in your village if a son asked this of his son? The father would beat him, of course, would be the reply. And then Kenneth would say, why is that? The request means he wants his father dead. In the Middle East, at a certain age, it is the duty of the son to care for parents. There's an obligation to care for elderly parents and then ensure that they are buried in a respectful way when they pass away. And so for a son to abandon this duty is one that brings ultimate shame on him. And what's interesting is at the beginning of Jesus' parable, we see that the father is very peaceful and grateful in his response. Quite the opposite from what Kenneth Bailey discovered in his survey. We see that in Jesus' story, after the request is made, the father, in Luke 15, 12, divided the property between his two sons. The son's earthly father does not do what a typical father would or should do. Many people surveyed said this would bring such a beating but not this father in Jesus' story. This father is different. And the story goes on to say that the son squanders all the inheritance given to him. And he soon realizes that even the servants in his own home have a better life than he does. And so he returns to seek forgiveness. Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And the father does something unthinkable. He runs. 
The old man, this is not in scripture, this is assumed, the old man likely hitches up his robe, exposing skin, exposing his legs in the most undignified and shameful way, and he runs to his son, likely through his village for everyone to see. An old man, a patriarch, running. It likely would have been a shock for everyone to see because they wouldn't have known what he was running for. Only the father saw his son. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him. The father didn't care what others thought of him. All he could think about was his son returning home. The same son who wished him dead in order to have money, the same son who walked out on him is coming home. And the father just can't wait for him to be home, and so he runs to him. And it's very interesting contrast between father and son. The son likely getting ready for the beating of a lifetime, full of fear and just hoping that his father would make him a hired servant. And the father running, not caring about the shame and dignity he was bringing upon himself, was just wanting to welcome his son home. And the story should have been one of anger and hatred and shame and loss of respect, but instead the father owned all of this because he ran. This story from Jesus would have stunned his audience because it's not what a typical father would do or should do. Normally, the father would be running to give the beating, but instead he ran to embrace. The father deliberately shamed himself out of love for his son. He made himself weak and undignified. The shame was cast aside in order to have a joyful reconciliation. And, you know, we typically take this, this message when we hear this, this story, this parable, that God will take us back no matter what. That's what I always took from this story. But I think there's, there's cultural significance here that, that I began to, to see and understand. And it might be slightly off. You might know more than I on this. But I think there's a cultural significance that we miss here in the West that is overlooked. And that, that's, that is the father ran and, and brought shame upon himself. And so when we put this story through the, the lens of a, of a Middle Eastern culture, we see the significance of the father running. It's about God taking on our shame. Our shame is not our shame anymore, but rather absorbed by the Father who simply doesn't care what others think about him in the act of running. And so, yes, the prodigal son is about God taking us back, but at a much greater cost to the Father, the cost of shame. And so the parable of the prodigal son is more about the Father than what we've let on in the West. Because it's about reconciliation, because of what the Father does. And it's interesting because the context of the parable of the prodigal son is told in a series of parables while Jesus is having a meal with the, with the religious Pharisees, who we know make their faith about themselves. And in the prodigal son, Jesus makes it about the Father and the sacrifices the Father makes, not the Son. And when we look at the story today, we can take the, to heart that we are in that story. We are the sons and daughters in that story. The story is about God the Father willing to get us back at all costs. Lastly, I want you to think about one other thing. This is this question. Who else ran in the Bible? I'm going to tell you one story, and as you read, you might find something else. There is one notable instance in the Gospels, and it's right near the end. We are met with Jesus dying on the cross and, and being buried. And we come across Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. I'm going to read you just a, a, a small snippet of this. The day of rest was over. There, it won't be on the screen because it's not planned. The day of rest was over. The sun was coming up on the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the grave. At once the earth shook, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. He came and pushed back the stone from the door and sat on it. His face was bright like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. 
The soldiers were shaking with fear and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who is nailed to the cross. He is not here. He has risen from the dead as he said he would. Come and see the place where he lay. Run fast and tell his followers that he has risen from the dead. He is going before you to the country of Galilee. You will see him there as I have told you. They went away from the grave in a hurry. They were afraid and yet they had much joy. They ran to tell their followers. They ran to tell the followers of Jesus what had happened. And when his followers heard this news, in Mark 16, 13, it says they ran to tell the news. Probably pulling up their robes, they went to see their tomb for themselves. The resurrection of Jesus made people run. They didn't think about what others thought. They didn't care about their dignity. They cared about Jesus. They put all those things aside to see if the resurrection was true. You know, I find it really fascinating that when we intertwine a, a cultural understanding of the things people do and did, we pull more meaning out of the story that we're so used to hearing. So as you read your Bible on your own, note when people run. And know that there's a cultural significance of this act is one that potentially brings a lot of shame on people when they do this. Note why they are running and who they might be running to or running from. It made people shrug off what others thought of them as they ran to tell others about the resurrection. And I find that just phenomenal. This week, remember that the resurrection of Jesus made people run. Let's pray. Father, what an incredible image that um, we just think about. You, you doing anything at all costs to reconcile with us, even if it means shaming yourself. What a shocking thing that could have been for people. What a shocking thing it is for us. But we thank you that you will do anything at a very high cost to reconcile with us. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
have uh, one quick announcement uh, before I just want to pray again. The funeral for uh, member Betty Hawkins is going to be this Friday at 11 a.m. here in the sanctuary. Okay, let's pray. Holy and gracious God, you, the one of prodigal grace, we give you thanks for the gift of life and for the blessing of this life, for family and friends and love abundant. Lead us through the trials and the suffering and the sorrow, the challenges and the struggles, the tired time, the despair and the bleak places, back to you in love abundant. Be with those who weep, who cannot sleep, who have no peace, who have release and who seek release. And comfort them with love abundant. Fill us with hope, sustained in your mercy, with patience and stamina upheld by your Holy Spirit in your prodigal grace. Transform us and all our broken ways. Transform us that we can be made whole. And in wholeness, may we be the hands and the heart and the feet of Jesus Christ. Amen. This week, as poor sinners, both you and I, as we stray from God, and it will happen, whether it be small or large, as we go to the Father for forgiveness, as we muster the courage to go to him and seek this out, know he is running towards us, hitching up his robe and taking on the shame that we have brought and running towards us in anticipation of reconciliation. Go in peace.